Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, lovely to see you today, Andy. Yeah, let's do this. And what you can't see if you listen to this on audio is that Sarah always has the most gorgeous pinkish red hair, which I love. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah it's definitely it's... Um, bright. <laughs> Yeah, I think exactly that. It, it 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 sums up for me what um this alcohol free adventure is all about, isn't it? It's not something to be sort of, you know, ashamed of or that you hide away. I just love the way that you show up so vibrant and energized in not only your the way that you communicate, but also the way in your appearance. I just think it's joyful. So I just oh, wanted to say thank that. You, <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. That's so really nice. for those that that don't know your story just yet because I, I realize we haven't actually done a podcast together before you and I know each other we've trained together before you know I've been a great admirer of everything you do in your incredible book and also all the work you've been doing in the sober space but for those that don't know how you ended up here would you mind just giving us a bit of that story yeah yeah of course I would um sobriety was probably a long time coming for me um I knew for sure that something had to change a long time before it did. Um, I probably had quite a traditional British relationship with alcohol growing up and through my teens. Um, I lived in a tiny, tiny village. Um, I worked in the village pub from when I was 14 and drank in there from when I was 14. The licensing laws although they're the same now were um, dealt with differently in those yep. days um, I went to university through that ladette period of time um, and I lived with guys while I was at university and I'm five foot nothing but very much aspired to do the keeping up with them as far as drinking yeah. was concerned as far as partying was concerned um, I came back from university and worked in London, where the culture, very, I, I worked in central London on Trafalgar Square, the culture was very much work hard, play hard, a lot of the work that I did was in events and hospitality as part of my role. Um, there were many occasions where I didn't even have time to get the night bus back home after the tube had stopped running. So I would just go back to work and sleep in the first aid room for a couple of hours before oh, <laughs> cracking on nice with my move. day's work. Many of oh, us have been there. On, oh, you know, and, and my 20s, my early 20s, that really did feel like living the dream. I'd studied at university, was doing the job that I said... I wanted to get to and enjoy. I was managing people. I was feeling like I was part of an amazing team. I It, it felt like everything that it should have been, um, apart from the hangovers, which were crushing, devastating, full of anxiety, then questioning my life purpose and probably outwardly looking like everything was fine, but inwardly feeling a bit dead inside at that time. Um, I moved out of working in London and um, was managing a, a big attraction just outside um, the M25. Met my husband, um, we got married when I was in my mid-twenties and had the boys um, less than two years apart, there's 20 months between them. Um, after I'd had the boys, I think I started drinking then in a way that I never had done previously. So I think in my 20s, it was about um, confidence and yeah. being part of a bigger group of people. And into my 30s, it became something altogether a bit more insular um, and about probably looking for some kind of escape yeah um I definitely see over the years that there was a bit of pattern in looking for the you know if if I were to take the motherhood example I would say I was listening to sound bites like or you know reading books like hurrah for gin and it's wine o'clock and it must be five o'clock somewhere and and looking for the 
I suppose, reassurance that everyone else was doing the same thing that I was. Now recognising that I was really struggling with a loss of identity, that, you know, my maternity leave, when that ended, I thought I would go back to my my job part time, like all of my my friends had done. And that avenue um, wasn't available. And then there was a stressful lead up to and telephone, well, which ended with me um, having a court date set and conversations with a barrister because I was going to um, go to court about not being able to return to my, my role as I should have been able to. It all just added extra layers of yeah. feeling like my role in life had massively changed and was out of my control. This was a period in my time, life where I was probably at my most vulnerable, my most yeah. tired, my most overwhelmed. Um, and, you know, a couple of glasses a night felt like a bit of an uh, escape. Um, it felt like it helped with being exhausted. It helped, it felt like it gave my husband and I an opportunity to have a bit of time together on the sofa in the evening chatting about our days. Um, and I suppose the moment that I knew it really was going to change was in 2017 when I'd had a big night out with some friends in London. I, although I live outside of London now, I go in regularly to catch up with friends and um, and do the things I want to do hanging out um, in a big city. And this particular night out looked like any other was cocktails, dinner, few drinks afterwards, um, was completely plastered, got the last train home. My friend always, he, he is such a kind person, always used to call me the train station before my train station to make sure that I was awake yeah, and capable awake. of getting off at my stop. <laughs> um, and the hangover the next morning was absolutely devastating but no worse than one I might have had a hundred times before but something had changed and in that t moment when I contemplated life the next morning got the kids to school I had sorted myself out by mid-morning I thought yeah th this has got to change this this isn't okay anymore but it actually took me two and a half years to do something different. Um, and that's really and interesting, even if I could jump in there, because that's yeah. probably very addictive of my story. I think it was probably a good two and a half years to three years right. before I went on that longer term alcohol free adventure. I think it was the sort of epiphany wake up moment it happened two or three years before. And I muttered those immortal words, never again. Like so many people do, but it was the first time I think I became yeah. conscious of my relationship with alcohol and conscious of the fact that, oh, actually, yeah. is this serving me in the way that I thought it once was? And then there was that whole, you know, yeah. two and a half years, three years of stopping and starting and becoming more aware and getting it wrong and getting it right. And then actually sort of really losing that that love affair with alcohol, which I had prior to that yeah. and thinking it was all good and it was all upside to really gaining that, you know, heightened awareness of actually I don't think this is serving me at all like not one bit and and that you know that sat behind that eventual moment when I said yes and that was almost 10 years ago and I think that's really important to share because I think a lot of people can look at this as someone like yourself or myself that's on these longer alcohol-free adventures and think oh we probably just made a decision because we've got amazing willpower and we just yeah. turned it on and off but the truth is very often if you look at most people's story there's a big Bit, like a years of a build up to that moment that it finally happens. Yeah. yeah. And and I think it's really useful for us to remember this about ourselves and be very conscious, you know, in the conversations we have with people who are first of all becoming sober curious, recognizing that this is a way of life that is living that isn't miserable, lonely and boring, that it is joyful and exciting and has got obviously so much going for it that 
the idea that somebody would say, oh, okay, today is my day one and push off from that point and never look back would be incredibly unusual. And I certainly did not have the, let's just say for the moment, language right at that point that I do now. And what I now consider to have been a time of exploration, experimentation, moderation, I certainly would not have known to have recognised what I was doing in that period was reducing my harm, reducing my exposure to alcohol, experimenting. You you know, by the time I finished drinking, I was able to go out and have two glasses of wine on a big night out, have a lovely time, get myself home, not leave my phone in the back of the taxi, not throw up on the way home, not leave all my clothes on the stairs on the way up. And, And so in many ways, somebody would say, well, then there's nothing to see here. There's no problem. She's drinking under the government guidelines for safe drinking of alcohol. Um, but it was a problem for me. And and I think if I hadn't have had that period of d- joining up each of those little dots one by one, I never would have got to the start line. The start line was just a little way ahead of me. <laughs> And this is such a brilliant conversation because I love that concept that there you were in that moment, you have that big night out, that never again moment. And then slowly but surely over a period of years, you're experimenting, taking breaks. You've got it into a place in theory where lots of people, that's the dream relationship with alcohol, isn't it? It's like, oh, I don't want to stop completely. What I really want is to be able to go out, have two drinks, great fun, not leave my clothes on the stairs, not fall asleep on the train on the way home and just enjoy it for those one or two drinks. So what I'm quite interested in about this story is that you then decided, even though you'd got it into that place, effectively what lots of people, you know, dream about that almost, you know, the great oasis of being able to take it or leave it with their drinking. What happened then? And why did you then decide to go completely sober? Assuming that you are now, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. In- interestingly, I I never do. I n- that that phrase never again is one that I don't use. So I, I I don't drink. I have been sober since 2019. Um but I can't say the never again thing myself because I never could trust myself when I said that, you know, over a thousand yeah. hangovers. I always knew that that was a lie. So I happen not to say that out loud, even though I am, you know, really sure I am never drinking again. It's that's one of those how I quieten the voice in the back of my head tools that I use. Um, I think the thing that really brought me to the start point was knowing that I looked as if I and I certainly felt as if I could be in complete control of my relationship with alcohol, knowing that I could by that point easily do a sober October, a dry January, um, that I could um, have two glasses of wine and not feel compelled to finish the bottle is about something to do with probably being unconventional and saying, okay, I think that I probably can do something that is a little bit more, I'm going to use the word extreme for want of a better word, but I didn't know anybody in my life who would ever say, I'm going to have a year not having a drink. I knew plenty of people who might, I don't know, run a marathon, climb a mountain, or do something physically challenging in another way. And I just wondered what would be on the other side of a year if I ran this this idea of an alcohol-free year, I would then be able to absolutely prove to myself and to anyone who happened to be watching, although I don't know who I might have been thinking of when I say that, that I didn't have a problem with alcohol. And when I say to you the word problem, I, I use that as kind of shorthand, I suppose, Alcohol, at the point at which I stopped drinking it, wasn't causing me um, 
anything that looked like a massive problem. But it was just a niggle in the back of my head that I thought, if I can just choose to do away with this for a year, see what difference it makes to me physically, emotionally and spiritually, I can then make a different choice in 365 years, uh, 600, uh, 365 days time and decide I can either go back to where I was in that place of a take it or leave it drinker or um, I will. St- in fact, I, I think I probably did just think as far as that I can go back to it if I want to. Yeah. Um, and and I just never did because by then I, I knew did. better. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what's fascinating about that for me is, well, twofold. Firstly, is that I think in truth, not that I have a problem with moderation because it is possible and you're a living, breathing example of something that probably looked and felt quite like moderation. But in truth, yeah. moderation's got so many blurred lines, hasn't it? You know, I think yeah. what a lot of people would consider moderation might be the odd two or three drinks here and there. And three drinks in a row, three average sized drinks in a row is technically binge drinking. Yes. You know, so I think mm-hmm. our, our barometer of what's moderation is completely out of whack anyway. I think most people would consider three drinks a warm up. I would have done. That's like, we well, have that before you even go out. That's technically a binge drinking. I think moderate drinking always implies to me, I really want more. I'm going to, you know, use my willpower to drink less. So I think that always is difficult for people because then, of course, they get tired, they get hungry, they get stressed, they get emotional. And that, like, resilience, that willpower muscles depleted, therefore, they end up having the three or four or more. Then you've got the wedding, then you've got the birthday, then you've got the Christmas, then you've got the holiday. So I think a lot of the time when people are describing something that feels a bit like they're a moderate drinker, they're nowhere, near, they're nowhere close to a moderate drinker. Uh, because those lines are so blurred Um, but equally and the second part to that which I like I think the only way to truly find out what your relationship is with alcohol is to take an extended break is to really look at it like you did for a year because then you know you know over that period of time am I really not doing the moderation thing or am I still in some way drawn back to that thing that is alcohol whereas if you can really genuinely be a moderator take it or leave it why not you know extend that for a, for a longer period of time as you did yeah absolutely i d- i think one of the things that had been completely lost on me up until that point i had been working as a youth worker for years and years and one of the things that i had spent a massive amount of my time doing was speaking to young people in the youth justice system all day long about their substance use and misuse whilst never for a single second considering my own and of course what I was the substance that I enjoyed was for sale on a supermarket shelf and with the young people I was working for it may or may not have been and I definitely do remember having those moments where I would be chatting to a young person about something that was going on for them and I'd say something and I'd think to myself oh that sounds like really good advice why don't I (laughs) Yeah. try that I found myself actually starting to listen to my words that I was not the intended audience of and recognizing that there sounded like there was some sense in it and so much of that is interesting for me in that we've got this disassociation between alcohol and the drug that it is it's a legalized yeah. drug just like tobacco and coffee for yeah. example but then we yeah. look at the illegal drugs and think oh they're somehow totally separate but they're not. It's just a governmental yeah. decision. For example, you can go to a lot of states yeah. in America now and happily smoke marijuana, cannabis, and it's legal, whereas it's yeah. illegal here. It's just a governmental decision. It doesn't change the, the, the constitution yeah. of those you know, toxic compounds, be it yeah. alcohol, be it heroin. Like They're all the same thing, ultimately, underneath it all. Yet we have this weird disassociation. It's like, well, alcohol is not a drug. There's drugs and alcohol which again is another sort of marketing sleight of hand, a governmental way of phrasing something that shouldn't be phrased in that way because they're all drugs. These are legal. These are illegal. And I think it creates that strange disassociation. Like how many, for example, people right now would be talking over a few glasses of wine about the drug problem that we have, the opaque crisis, or like talking about these things completely disassociated from the fact that whilst they're having that conversation, they themselves 
of drinking or taking a drug. It just so happens to be legal. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Crazy stuff. So on that note, and one thing that I wanted to segue into is you as a coach as well. And you go on this lovely adventure and you turn into this fabulous coach because something you said there's important as well. I often find that when I'm coaching someone or being coached, these lovely little insights come out and you're like, oh, that's pretty good. I think I'll keep that for me. <laughs> Even though you're coaching someone else and they're getting this little breakthrough, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have that one at the end of this session because that was really insightful. Yeah. So it was interesting to hear yeah. you say that. I think when you start to coach people, that's why lots of coaches go on this, I think, transformational journey themselves because they're constantly, you know, either helping someone else or helping themselves to go on that adventure. So tell us a little bit about that. You, you, you stop drinking, you go on this incredible journey yeah. and then and then what happens? Yeah, so I had my, my background in coaching and mentoring, mentoring is, is more than 14 years now. Um, wow. My um, coaching um, as far as sobriety um, journey started um, in about, 20, well, it was 2020, I um, set up my business. I was going through a period where I, the um, role that I had in local government was, uh, my role was going to be made redundant. And so I had this opportunity to start setting my business up on the side. I chatted to my line manager about it, knew that I had the capacity um, to start doing some work at that point in the evenings and weekends around my day job. Um, and my business really has grown in all sorts of different and unexpected ways. I coach for, for myself. I also, um, do some work coaching as a recovery coach for a homeless charity and a community interest company. I've had so many interesting opportunities come my way, um, that, that idea that thinking that a redundancy is going to be impactful in a negative way um, actually never was for me. I was really lucky to know that I was going to set up and do what, what I was then focused on. Um, certainly as far as if I think my life trying to get that personal and professional um I'm slightly wary to use the word balance but let's just use it for the purposes of this conversation um into the right kind of um feel for myself um my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes um about six years ago now and three months after that my husband was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and there's nothing quite like health challenges coming across your path to, I think, give you the pointer to reevaluate the things yeah. that really always are important. And it's really easy for us to say, oh, you know, our health is one of the most important things and also dismiss it in the same sentence. Um, but these conditions come with massive challenges you know they, yeah. these take up a lot of our physical time our emotional time you know there's a lot of back and forth from the hospitals from clinics there's a lot you know that goes on in our lives where actually I want to be able to be in the best possible position to be the best support I can the best champion the best cheerleader um, without getting tied up you know in any kind of um, downward spiral about it all and as I say that out loud I always feel like I have to qualify I don't have any ideas around um, you know that always look on the bright side thing you know that toxic positivity that's really easy to be on the receiving end of when stuff is going slightly wrong um, mm. those aren't never the kind of words that come out of my mouth but um, you know, finding your pathway through this kind of stuff that aligns with your values, that feels good, that allows you to still get on and fulfil your purpose, do your stuff whilst, you know, looking at the other things that are going on in your life. 
Yeah, and I think that's the beautiful thing about a great coach as that guide in many ways, isn't it? That allows you to explore your own world, your own thoughts, limiting beliefs, get aligned with your values and, and you know, carve your own path through whatever your given situation is, whether it be in the alcohol-free space or the executive space. I think that's where it gets a lot of its power. And I still get coached and mentored all the time, have done for the last 12 years because I need it. I need to get out of my own head into a space where I can converse with someone else and then sort of look at it all and then put it all back in a format that makes makes more sense to me. And I know you've been doing such incredible work in the, in the sober space. And something else you said there's really important, and, and I do the similar thing. There's bits of what I do as, as a coach that manifest in all sorts of different ways. You know, I work for the Professional Footballers Association and give lectures and talks in their business school. I also work in the corporate space, which is really economical. I also do lots of work, obviously, in the, in the, in the alcohol-free space, but you can offset different things, can't you? So there's certain things that I do are much more economical than others, which, like you say, you've been volunteering in spaces as well. I do a lot of stuff in the alcohol-free space, which I'm less concerned about it being economical because I just want to give back and contribute. And I think that's, again, as you said, that balance, if you can get that right in your own life, creates what I believe is a really fulfilled meaningful life and I can see that shine through with all of your challenges that are going on to still show up and shine and own it and be there for other people because it takes a lot of energy to be there for other people I think it's just incredible good on you and just while we're on a roll with this I I, I wanted to well there's two things I definitely want to cover off I want to talk about your book your incredible book so I want people to know about that and then I want to have a, a conversation that we started before we came on air which was very much exploring bringing um, a heightened awareness, I think, to the corporate space, let's say, about alcohol-free. So maybe we'll start, should we start with the book and then we'll we'll get into yeah. s- s- some of the corporate stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the book I wrote this time last year, um, just after, um, it's Drink Less, Live Better. And you and I had had a conversation about yeah. it Um I think probably December time last year and in the back of my mind I I had it as a bit of a I think probably a task on my to-do list Uh, and I had probably written down something like write book (laughs) which on a to-do list is not a terribly easy thing just to tick off in a (laughs) in a one I definitely had not broken it down into manageable chunks or anything like that um and I knew that the content of my book was scattered around in a hundred different files on the laptop and in my brain and in podcast episodes um and all sorts of different places and actually Once I set my mind to it, the writing of the book was not a difficult task in itself. I wonder actually now thinking out loud about it, whether it was similar to my run up to sobriety in as much as loads of thinking had gone on beforehand. And when I actually just sat down and did it, it wasn't a painful exercise. It was an exercise that flowed really quite naturally. Um, So it was published in July last year. Um, Had an amazing book launch at Club Soda um, in Covent Garden in London. Um, It became a bestseller um, in the, I think it was about on three different places, the day of publication and then about another six the week afterwards. Brilliant. Um, and my favorite thing about publishing a book, which is a complete unexpected benefit, I didn't realize this was going to happen, is people DMing me and sending me pictures of them reading the book. You know, I've got pictures of it in a, you know, on a beach in Egypt, uh, on Bali, I've got it on a sun lounger in Egypt, on a, you know, all, all these different places around the world. Um, so it's available as a paperback in all the places where you might um, choose to buy a book. And it's also available um, um, as, a, as a download. Um, I will record the Audible version uh, at some point. Um, That's hard. But I'm just in talk. 
it, it, I'm in talks with yeah. a publishing it's, house it's at a, the moment. Oh, so you, to get that audio. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great yeah, news so as I'm well. So did you self-publish initially? Yep. Yep, but I self-published initially. That's now approached you. See, that's really yeah. interesting as well, because I know Annie Grace as well. This Naked Mind was uh, initially self-published and then Penguin approached her and then turned it into a published book. That's what I say to a lot of our coaches, a lot of people out there that are thinking about writing a book. Like I did for my first two, they were big, with big publishers, Pam McMillan, Asta, and now I've got three that are almost ready to go, but I'm going to self-publish those ones. I just want to have that experience of self-publishing. But as I said to a lot of people, if the book goes well, a publisher will soon reach out to you anyway. So it's a brilliant way to sort of get around the system. You just put it out into the world and then refine it and see do people like it. And then if it goes well, you might get a knock on the door. So that's incredibly exciting. Yeah, yeah. And and I think if I go back to my initial thoughts about putting a book out in the world, it was for the reasons of hoping that somebody else might see a little bit of their story and my story that might be useful or motivating or helpful. And and it's serving that purpose absolutely from the feedback that I'm getting. So the idea that um, my book, I, I consider it to kind of sit slightly in between, um, if quit lit is a genre, which I never knew it yeah. was years ago, but you and I now both know it is. If there is a set of books that are more, let's say, memoir -y, and a set of books that are more science-y, for want of a better better term, yeah. we, I think my book sort of sits somewhere in the middle of that. There is some lived experience stuff in there, but it is all about the resources. It is all about the useful tools the what what helps people move forward and it's sort of written in a format that hopefully is one that you can read the book with your um antenna out for the drinking less the alcohol free the sober lifestyle but actually you could read the th book through a second time a third time a fourth time and apply it to career relationships family life whatever the next thing is that you'd like to have a good think about so, yeah, the, the publishing experience was was a, a roller coaster ride um, at the same time as I was writing my final draft. I was diagnosed with breast cancer um, I and so 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 2023 involved drafting and redrafting um, my manuscript in between two different sets of surgery, radiotherapy. Um, and it felt like, you know, at the beginning of the year, we often say, oh, you know, what are our goals? What do we want from the year? I don't know, maybe some people are talking about resolutions and changing habits and stuff like that. If you'd have said to me at the beginning of 2023, what it was going to deliver, I, I think I'd have asked for my money back right at the start. It was <laughs> skip that year, you know. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, but you know, you get to the end of the year and you're there to tell the tale. So, you know, I I suppose there are always bits in life that are going to be slightly less than ideal, and certainly, you know, there were bits of last year that were more than slightly less than ideal. Um, but navigating a way through it, you know, recognizing at the twenty twenty at the beginning of twenty twenty four, I can't. I suppose I had a, a maybe a greater. I'm not keen on this word, but a greater resilience because I remember saying to a friend, right, you know, twenty twenty four, I'm I'm ready for it, and then thought, oh, better be a bit careful. Like, what might I get thrown yeah. <laughs> this time? <laughs> So, yeah, it's um, and, been a bit of a wild ride through the publishing. It has, and I remember that so well because we were doing some work together and it, I remember exactly that. It was like, I'm going to write the book, and then you wrote it in about five minutes. 
and then it was yeah. on to the next draft. You did it really quickly, I remember. And then you had the, the breast cancer diagnosis and then you had to go through that. And here you are again, as I said earlier, still shining that light. And for people that are listening, because we didn't actually say it, the book is Drink Less, Live Better. Yes, that's right. Drink Less, Live Better. Brilliant. And now what I wanted to talk about um, is about this whole corporate angle that uh you know i think something we're both quite passionate about my background is very much in the in the corporate space as a broker and whatnot and then i've always thought wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have something similar to mental health first aiders you know that where you know again if, if we wind back the clock five ten years that just wasn't a thing that existed right mental health just wasn't a thing no one spoke about it right whereas now we're very um comfortable with it many organizations have Exactly that, mental health first aiders. They have a whole litany of courses, support. It's very open, which is incredibly helpful, right? And I wish in some ways, and this is my hope and my dream, that actually we'll be able to do something for alcohol in the workplace. So what, what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, amongst the other things that went on in 2023, I'm really fell in love with public speaking um, and spoke at lots of well-being festivals and events last year. And now, you know, my desire to get into those corporate workplaces has really been, um, I suppose, lit up on, on the back of that. I agree, you know, these conversations we have about mental health now have come on leaps and bounds in the last few years. And I really, you know, question how it is okay to have conversations about our mental well-being, you know, personally and professionally. We're, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, brave enough, bold enough to have conversations about menopause in the workplace. These are the, you know, these are important conversations. Why are we leaving alcohol out of these conversations? And, you know, if I were just to take reference back to one tinier part of our earlier conversation you know we don't talk about drugs do we we talk about drugs and alcohol and so that is one of the I suppose barriers for want of a better word that I have come up against that idea that somebody in a workplace if I'm talking about alcohol they might say well, we don't want our workforce to think that we're telling them what to do, what relationship to have without uh, with alcohol. And I wouldn't in my wildest dreams tell anybody anything <laughs> about probably anything. I wouldn't for a single second think that coming into somebody's workplace and, I don't know, delivering a talk on everybody stop drinking now might go down really well, not least of all because I'd have been the least glad recipient of that myself at some point in the not too distant past. Um, so the idea that we open these conversations gently, um, the idea that team leaders, managers might currently find themselves in difficult conversations with members of their staff, perhaps in one-to-one -one conversations, how well is that team leader or manager equipped if a member of staff says, I'm really struggling to cope with a tricky diagnosis, for example, in the family or with myself at the moment? I've got stuff going on in my personal life that's causing me worry. I'm probably drinking a bit too much um, as, as a way of trying to deal with what's going on. And we would go to those really... Um, well rehearsed lines you know have you spoken to your GP about this have you looked at AA might be the kinds of conversations that actually become conversation stoppers instead of conversation openers and very often people need somebody to hear them to listen to them non-judgmentally to be open to a back and forth conversation about what is going on for them emotionally what is going on for them at the moment at home our professional and personal lives collide all the time and so one of the things that um, I've been talking about in workplaces is about the overwhelm that I've experienced in my life at various different points I have 
used alcohol as a way of dealing with the bigger things that have been going on behind the scenes, let's say, that I never would have taken into the workplace. And in a workplace, somebody might say to you, why don't you call the employee assistance program? Um, which I'm not going to do an employee assistance program down may may be useful in some ways. And certainly I've been on the receiving end of some fabulous counselling through that kind of service before. But helping your staff to be future focused, helping your staff to um, find the resources that really work for them, that really help them to manage their situations better, can almost be the conversation about alcohol by stealth. Um, you know, a, a different way in. Um, we will all have our different ways of coping with what's going on. And in the workplace, sometimes I think, you know, I'd have been guilty in the past of using overwork as a way of dealing with the stuff that's going on at home. And actually, my workplace might have been really delighted about that because they were getting a, a good deal um, out of me. But it wasn't doing me any any good at all. Um, so yes, I think there's so many different conversations that we can have in the workplace and the more open minded that we can be about how we start those conversations and remembering really, really importantly that listening is such a big part of the conversation, uh, you know, not shutting people down, recognising that when somebody says something to you that might be a bit frightening, that, you know, might be the first time they've mentioned out loud about their alcohol consumption or their other substance use, to have somewhere within the organisation that is a safe place to put that conversation and feel assured that it's going to be handled really professionally and well. Yeah, it's so powerful. And I've been speaking about this for years, even going into the, the corporate space myself a lot. And what I noticed is if anything's framed around alcohol, no one turns up. I'm over-exaggerating, but barely anyone turns up. I've made that mistake before into a corporate space because who wants to show up in a talk about alcohol? Because then it feels like I'm stigmatized the second I walk into that room or join that Zoom call, you know, in an employee basis. I'm sort of singling, signaling to everyone in the company that clearly I've got an issue with alcohol. That's why I'm going to this talk about alcohol. So first and foremost, we had to put different frames around it. So very much it was always about performance. You know, a performance is this getting in the way of your performance. There's lots of different things you can do to influence your performance, optimizing your sleep. What's one of the best ways to optimize your sleep? Reduce alcohol, fitness, nutrition, you know, meditation, whatever it be, but actually what underpins a lot of that or what undermines a lot of that is alcohol. So like you described, it just gives you a bit of a stealth way to have that conversation. But really we want to get to that place where we are with menopause right now or with mental health, where actually people are really comfortable to talk about it before, where again, menopause is one of these things that just, it feels like no one ever spoke about it. And now it's people that like even myself, I'm comfortable even talking about it, if you know what I mean. And that's and rightly so, because these have a huge impact on our own well-being, staff performance, all of these things. Therefore, it makes sense that employers would want to provide support services around these things. Yet the alcohol one is so taboo. It's like, oh, we don't want to go there. We'll, we'll look at all these other things, but we don't want to do the alcohol thing because it's going to look like we're telling people off. We're being nanny state. And the truth is, underneath a lot of that, probably those people that might be the ones or the gatekeepers to those talks or those initiatives are probably drinking quite a lot themselves, like most people. Therefore, it's much harder, isn't it, to view that message in a positive light if your idea and you're a HR director and your idea of being social is a free bar or a big knees up of a, an event that involves alcohol and then someone rocks up and says, I want to do a talk, talk on the alcohol thing, probably less likely to embrace it. So. I think we've got quite a lot of work to do, but it's wonderful that you're out there um, trying to knock down those doors. And what I've noticed, people are becoming more and more receptive to it, where they just yeah. wouldn't entertain these conversations. Not long ago, yeah. corporates are working it out, right? They want optimal performance. What's the one thing, like I described, that undermines their performance? What's the one thing that leads to presenteeism consistently in the office? It's alcohol. What's the number one thing that destroys performance of your staff? 
alcohol. What's the number one thing that probably leads to those cascading knock-on effects that undermines our mental health? Alcohol, what exasperates menopause? Alcohol, I mean, I could go on. It's always the alcohol thing, yet it's the last thing you want to talk about. Whereas for me, that should be the first thing. That should be the number one conversation. And as you described there, it's not about you rocking up and saying everyone's got to stop drinking. It's just bringing awareness to it, isn't it? Bringing awareness to the fact that actually those two or three drinks twice, thrice, a week might be the thing that's destroying your sleep, making you tired, making you grumpy, making you less productive. It might be the thing that's meaning you're not reaching your sales target because you've got a bit of low-grade anxiety, so you're fearful of picking up the phone. It might be that. What about you take a tactical break, compare yourself between the two as you in your workplace as a middle lane drinker and you in the workplace alcohol-free. See if there's a difference. And I guarantee it for almost every middle lane drinker, there will be a marked difference. I think that's the type of conversations that we also need to have on top of what you described, which was that beautiful space of just being there and ready to listen to someone rather than picking them up and going, oh, you need to go to the AA. You need to phone this hotline because that's terrible advice for most people that are sort of middle lane style drinkers. They just need to be heard and, and encouraged. Yeah, I love it. It's exciting. All of these things. And what's great about this, Sarah, is that, that you and I have been at this for a long while now. So you're starting to see these conversations unfold, which um, yeah. it's really important. The work that you're doing, the, the work that I'm doing is actually to start to have these conversations. And my hope is that people listening to this that might be HR directors, that might own their own corporation, that might be in a corporate space, might reach out to yourself, for example, to come in and have those great conversations. Let's start those conversations and make it much more comfortable for people to talk about their relationship with alcohol and then to maybe do something about it. Yeah, and I think it doesn't need to be done in any big, scary way. You know, organisations are having wellbeing days all of the time. You know, it can be an added in, an optional extra. It can be something that doesn't feel like it's being presented as, you know, something that you must must attend you know as a um three line whip you know something that is for for you to consider the the benefits of yeah well-being day so skillful and, and exactly that and it might just be that actually by bringing you in on a consultancy basis which i think is a great idea they might just review how they entertain their staff and rather than it all yeah. being about alcohol it's more so about alcohol free and of course there might be alcohol there but it's almost takes the place of where alcohol free is now I, it's the thing at the back of the counter that people can sort of go out of their way to get to as opposed to the thing that's out front and i always say this as well you know the senior people in an organization set the tone don't they so and, and i think when i've sat with some huge corporations billion multi-billion dollar corporations before and i've been into their organizations and they've shown me around the incredible work that they do they've got people with their uh, lanyards on mental health first aiders they've got sleep pods meditation pods i remember asking this one particular organization how do you get together how do you like socialize as a team given that they've just done all of this incredible work around mental health and it was like well what we do is we've got a bar and it's free so what we do on a tuesday the boss the ceo he comes out on a tuesday and we invite everyone along and we all have a load to drink and i was like what's your mental health like on a wednesday I bet it's take a battering. I bet your mental health first aiders have rushed off their feet on a Wednesday and you could see the penny drop in. And, and then we're all oh, no, on a Thursday. We have thirsty Thursdays as well. And the, all the directors come to that one. And I was like, you've got to understand psychology. If the CEO is going to a drinks event, what message does that send to all the directors? The directors are like, well, I don't want to get thrown out of the tribe. If the CEO's rocking up, I'm going to rock up. And if the CEO's drinking, I better drink. But you can bet 50% of those directors are thinking, I don't want to drink. You know, I'm going to be late home. I'm going to be rubbish in the morning. I've got a big sales quota. I've got a big meeting. I'm going to upset my partner. But of course, social pressure, they all end up drinking. What message does that send to the line workers? Well, if the CEO's drinking, the directors are drinking, I don't want to be thrown out of the tribe. I better turn up and I better drink, even though I don't want to drink because I don't want to be rubbish at my job. I don't want to upset my partner. I don't want to be a rubbish parent. So when I explained this to the, the HR director there, you could see the penny drop all over the place. It was like, oh, 
I hadn't, I just hadn't even thought of that. And I was like, exactly. That, if that was me running this business, the worst thing you could possibly do for your business is have two socially pressurized free drinking events every week where you get the CEOs and the directors to rock up. Just forget the alcohol bit. Invite in a great speaker like Sarah to come in and inspire people. Get your you know your your groups together in a different way a healthy way a productive way that's not going to batter their mental health yeah so true so important gone off on one keep shining the lights turn them all on yeah yeah i love it well sarah thank you so much for joining me today um that was such a wonderful conversation just a little warm-up we will do this again no doubt how can people find out a bit more about you get in touch with you Yep. Um, I'm at drinklesslivebetter.com um, and drinklesslivebetter um, on Instagram or Facebook as well. Marvellous. Well, thank you for joining me today. Hopefully many people will reach out to find out all the wonderful things you do. Hopefully you'll be in the corporate space very soon, shining that wonderful light. And thank you for everything you do. It's a pleasure. Lovely to see you today, Andy. <laughs>